Well, if you were with us last week, then you already know that we've began a new sermon series uh, where we're looking at the seven final sayings of Jesus as he hung on the cross. And last week, we looked at the very first of those sayings, which was Jesus declaring in his final moments, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And we explored not only the prophetic, messianic mystery revealed, but we also talked about how Jesus' heart is forgiveness. In fact, actually, we also talked about how in Isaiah it was literally prophesied that he would be counted, numbered among the transgressors, and that he would make intercession for them. And there he was on the cross, interceding on the behalf of sinners, the very people that nailed him to the cross. But now, in our passage today, we see actually immediate fruit from Jesus' prayer. That when Jesus prayed, that somebody actually responded to the forgiveness that is offered in Father God. And so our passage today comes from Luke, chapter 23. Verses 39 through 43. And so if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and open to Luke 23. Or if you want to pull out the Pew Bible, you can as well. But this is the word of the Lord. 39 through 43 in Luke 23. And one of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember we, me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Let's pray real quick, Lord. Again, I just ask that in the hearing of this word this morning, our, our hearts would be moved. God, that we would be drawn to you. And as we hear these words, Lord, we would respond appropriately. Because you have called us to respond. And Lord, I pray that as weak and as broken of a man that I am, that you would still use me this morning for the delivery of your word for the preaching of your gospel, for the revealing of your truth. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning as we look at this passage, as we look at this final, this second saying of Jesus from the cross, Jesus is saying is, and I want to remind us, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. But what is leading up to that moment for Jesus to say it? Well, we have two criminals who have two things to say. Specifically, they have two responses, two different responses to the person of Jesus on the cross. And so as we get to the saying of Jesus, I want us to walk through the responses of each criminal. The first one, it says in the very beginning in verse 39, and one of the criminals hanging there was blaspheming him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. 
And so we see the first response of the first criminal on the cross. He says, he says that he was blaspheming him, blaspheming Jesus. Blasphemy, so we have some ideas, some context as to what that word means, is defined as to speak profanely of sacred things, to slander, to speak impiously or irreverently of God. I think this would qualify. I mean, if you are looking at Jesus and you say to him, are you not the Christ? Like, honestly, oftentimes when I'm getting a little bit snippy, a little bit sarcastic, I might ask someone a question in the negative, like, uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head and I don't want to go this way, but hey, you know, if I was pulled over and a cop tried to start telling me like something that wasn't the law, I'm like, are you not an officer of the law? Do you not know what you're talking about? Uh, that was really bad, but also it's been known to happen. Uh, where we, we set up this, this situation where we might be talking to someone and we are going to ask them a negative question in order to sarcastically put them down. And so I would say that this really genuinely qualifies as blasphemy. He's irreverently, impiously speaking to the Son of God, who is God himself, by disidentifying him, by trying to question the identity of Jesus himself. In fact, he is using the exact same mocking language that we hear in verses 35 and in 37. In verse 35, it says, And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were scoffing at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is this Christ of God, his chosen one. And then in verse 37, it says, and the soldiers were saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. This criminal on the cross decides that he's going to mock Jesus in the same way that the scoffers mock him from the crowds. And I want to say this, this, this might be a warning to us. Just because it might be the loudest voice might not make it the right voice. Just because it is the loudest voice might not make it the right voice. I can't tell you how many times in my life I went along with something because the crowd was going along with it, because everybody else was doing it, because it seemed in the moment like the right thing to do because everybody else had come to the same place, the same conclusion that it was the right thing. But there have always been moments when I felt this tongue in my spirit and I was like, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't go with the crowd. Maybe I shouldn't do this thing that everybody else is doing. Maybe I should do things differently. And the reality is that part of following Jesus in our lives sometimes means to go against the flow of things, to go against the current, to go against the crowd, to be quite literally counter-cultural. When it seems like the whole culture is taking one direction, to be a follower of Jesus might mean to be able to stand in the place that is counter to the culture, to be counter cultural. And so we see in this moment with the criminal, with the, the sinner, and I think that's one of the things that I want us to do when we're reading this passage is we're putting ourselves in the place of the criminals. And in our own lives, we have two ways that we can respond to Jesus, and the first of which is this first criminal. We can just go with the crowd. We can listen to the other scoffers, and we can mock God with them or we can respond differently. But there is a danger to us being like the first criminal. In fact, in James chapter 1, and I mentioned this just in passing last week, but I want to read it this week because I think it's so important 
as to how we hear this passage this morning. This is James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. James writes this. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in gentleness, receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But become doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and has gone away, he immediately forgot what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man will be blessed in what he does. You know, it's, it's crazy to me also because that immediately brings me back to Psalm chapter one. Blessed is the man who meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. There's this idea of, of not just being a hearer, right? Because it's one thing to constantly hear and hear and hear. It's another then to actually respond to the very thing that you are hearing. And in this place, in this, in this world that we are called to live, countercultural, that we're called to live against the current of things going on, you can either respond by going with everybody else, which is scoffing, mocking, or... It is to actually hear what is being placed before you and then responding to it well. Further, I think that one way that this reminds me of another passage in Scripture is what is the criminal mocking Jesus about? He's mocking Jesus about his identity. He came and said that I am the Son of God. I am the Christ. And yet... The criminal says, are you though? Are you the son of God? Are you this Christ? There was another place in scripture where one questioned the identity of Jesus. It's found in that wilderness temptation in Matthew where Satan constantly confronted Jesus. If you are the son of God, then you can do these things. You should be able to do these things. If you are the son of God, jump and he will catch you. If you are the son of God, why don't you turn this stone into bread? But what was Jesus' response? Man should not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is a work of the word of the Lord in our lives. And so we have this moment where identity is questioned. And let me say this, that when it comes to our faith, the thing that the enemy is going to attack, the thing that Satan wants to come against, it's who you are. And it's who you believe that you are. Who it is that you say that you are, but also who it is that Jesus says that you are. And that's significant because we're going to get to this later. But this, ultimately, this entire passage is about one thing. It's about being known. It's about being known. And, and the question that I posit for us this morning is, are we known? Are we known? Do we know ourselves? Does God know us? Jesus actually spoke once in all of Scripture uh, about blasphemy um, in all of Scripture, in the, in the Gospels uh, where Jesus was speaking. Um, he spoke about blasphemy. He spoke about it in actually Luke chapter 12. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 10, he said this, And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But he who blasphemes 
against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. I think oftentimes we hear that passage and we wonder, well, what does it mean to blaspheme Jesus and what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? And I'm only bringing this up because I think it's important that we understand the difference. If we're going to follow Jesus, we need to understand the difference between blaspheming him and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Because there are plenty of times, I'm sure, in our walks with the Lord that we have blasphemed God spoken impiously about him, spoken irreverently about him, but also profane sacred things, that can be as simple as I doubted the work of God in my life. But let me be clear, those are forgivable. (laughs) That's the good news that Jesus brought on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. He said, regardless of what they're doing against me, Lord, I pray that you would forgive them. But the unforgivable, blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, you see, this is actually a blasphemy of denial. A denial of the saving work that the Holy Spirit does when one confesses Christ as Lord. So to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject God altogether. To say, I don't need you, I don't want you, I don't believe in you, I don't need salvation, I am a good enough person. That is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But what it really is, it's, it's one where you live your entire life that way. Where you have lived your entire life in complete rejection to the work of God in his son Jesus Christ which then comes to you through his Holy Spirit. And so let me be clear, every sin can be forgiven if you're willing to turn to the one who forgives them. Every sin can be forgiven as long as you are willing to turn to the one who will forgive it. And that is really good news to us because now we get into the part of the story where we see the immediate results of Jesus' intercession for transgressors. In verse 40, we start to see the work of Christ. It says this. Oh, I've got to turn back. Wrong page. It says this. I love this. But the other th- criminal answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? You know what I find so interesting and fascinating about this passage for me is that it seems that the church has lost its urgency to call people out when they need mercy. When they truly need forgiveness, when they actually need the work of God in their life, the church has become so lax in wanting to call sin, sin. But in this passage, we have two criminals who are hanging on the cross with Jesus. They have nothing left but their final breaths to make the urgency of what could be received in Jesus very, very real. And the second criminal takes the effort to say to the first criminal, do you have zero fear of God? Do you not realize that you are in your final moments and you're going to mock the Lord? You have an opportunity to seek forgiveness to receive. He was calling him out. And I fear in the, in the church, we've stopped calling it out. It's funny because they say there's no honor among thieves, and yet here you have a thief trying to do the honorable thing. We have this fear in the church that we can't call sin, sin to one another. Somehow that's unloving. I tell you the most loving thing we can do is to call it out. 
especially among our brothers and sisters. There should be a clear urgency within us to want to bring correction into each other's life, to encourage us to live the life that Jesus so desperately wants us to walk in. Because the reality for each and every one of us is that walking in sin is death. Even if it leads to eternal life because we have confessed Jesus is Lord, walking in sin is death for us. It doesn't add anything to our lives. In fact, it takes away what we could be living in. Which leads me to the fact that Jesus' message Jesus' primary message while he walked the earth was this. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Are we willing to be humble enough to repent every day for the sins in our life, for the things that we've done wrong, for the things that we have committed against God. I'm reminded again also in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, says this. Oops. Second Timothy 4 says this, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word and be ready in season, in season and out of season to reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Y'all, does that not sound like today? I mean, I'm not going to call out names, but how many preachers are willing to preach a message that's more about making you feel good about yourself than it is to make you feel good about the work that Jesus did in spite of yourself. Man, I want a message where I'm learning I'm not great, but Jesus is. I want to respond to the goodness of Christ in spite of who I am, not believe that I'm a great person and therefore that's getting me into the kingdom of heaven. We have so many that are just willing to give you dessert instead of lead you into the desert. Jesus was led into the desert in order to have that deep and abiding relationship with the Father, which he already had. But the wilderness experience for Jesus just shows to us how much the word of God was rooted in him pushes us to be in relationship with God. Let's not listen for the sweet things. Let's listen for the things that draw us into himself. And so, that is where this criminal actually begins. The second criminal begins by recognizing and acknowledging that he himself is, in fact, a sinner. He said, since you are under that same condemnation, and then he goes on, he says, for indeed, we are suffering justly. We're receiving exactly what we deserve. We were criminals. We committed crimes against the people of this city, and so, for we are receiving what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus did nothing wrong. We've talked about it so many times in here. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might receive his righteousness. Jesus knew no sin. He had never committed a wrong in his entire life. And yet there he was, numbered among the transgressors, transgressors inceding, interceding on their behalf. And here this criminal who recognizes his own brokenness, his own sinfulness, confesses that Jesus did nothing wrong. Now, How could he possibly know that? How could this criminal possibly know that Jesus had committed no wrong? None whatsoever. Well, I think this is a good moment to see how the Lord works in our lives to reveal truth. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 and 17, and Simon Peter answered, and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. As a good reformed Christian, it's the realization that the spirit works in your life first, and then you have nothing to do but to respond. It is by the grace of God that we respond to his work in our life. We do not willingly come to the Father and choose Jesus, but God first reveals Jesus to us, and then we respond because of his good grace. I really believe that's what's happening in this moment as that criminal hangs on the cross next to Jesus, recognizing his own sinfulness, is revealed by the Father who Jesus is, a man who committed no wrong, who sinned none, but took on the sins of the world. So that that criminal, as he hung there in his final moments, might receive what Jesus was offering. And here, the good news is revealed to a criminal on the cross in his final moments. What good news that is for us. That none of us are too far gone to be saved. But here is the real response that I want us to see this morning. Verse 42, and the criminal was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. The work of Jesus' intercession is fulfilled right here. For he is willing to receive forgiveness for the things that he's done. And he said to Jesus, remember me, remember me. And I think that two word phrase in English is the most significant phrase for us to understand in our passage this morning. Because I think oftentimes that we as followers of Jesus believe that we know Jesus. And that is all that is asked of us, is that we are to know Christ. That after confessing Jesus, we stop in our relationship with him and we enter into a relationship with the church. We attend Sunday mornings. We get involved in fellowship opportunities, attend Bible studies when we're able to. And we pray, but we've made it something that we do on a checklist of what it means to be Christian. We confess Jesus, we say we know him, but then we enter into a relationship with the church and we say goodbye to our relationship with Christ. The thing is, we confess Jesus with our mouths 
and we believe in our heart, but then we respond by just acquiring a lot of knowledge about who he is. But knowledge of Jesus is insufficient for the follower of Christ. And I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and qualify. I'm not about to preach a gospel plus message, which we've talked in the past. When we worked through the book of Galatians together, we realized that Paul kept bringing to the Galatians that there was this gospel plus mentality that they had, that they had to do something in addition to receiving the gospel in order for them to live faithfully. But I am telling you that this is not gospel plus, this is simply the gospel. When the criminal asked Jesus to remember him, it brings me directly to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. And this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and he says this. And this has always been a hard passage for me and a convicting passage. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, in your name did we not prophesy and in your name cast out demons and in your name do many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How can we know that we are saved, if there is a moment where Jesus could say to us, depart from me, I never knew you. What does it mean to do the Father's will that Jesus said, if you do the will of my Father who's in heaven, you will enter? I mean, look at this list. Many of us think that good works are evidence of what is the will of the Father in, this life, in, in our lives. But it says that these people prophesied and they cast out demons and they did miracles. No offense to any of us, but I think when we enter the church, we think, well, I'm a good preacher. I'm preaching the word of God every Sunday. I show up to do my ushering duties. I've served as an elder. I go and show up at the food pantry that somehow or another that doing the work of the church is actually fulfilling the will of God in our lives. That we're doing things for Jesus. And I'm not saying that those are important things that we shouldn't serve, that we shouldn't walk with one another in the church, but our works don't matter to him. Even the ones that we're proclaiming that we do in his name. Because honestly, I think prophecy and casting out demons and working miracles is far more significant than me standing up here every Sunday. And I think it's more significant than many of the things that we do in the church that we say it's for Jesus. But here's what Jesus says. This is what it means in order to inherit the kingdom. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you hear that? What is required of us so that we do not depart from him? It is this, that he knows you. It is not simply that you know him, that you've obtained knowledge of who he is, though it's significant and it's important, but it is also that he knows you. The gospel is the good news of the work of Jesus and his invitation for us to know him and to be known by him. Are you bringing yourself, the real, authentic, broken, sinful you to Jesus? Does he know you? Does he know your weaknesses? Does he know your flaws? Does he know your pridefulness? Does he know your past, your present, your dreams? Does he know your likes and your dislikes? Does he know you? Have you brought yourself to him and allowed him to inform you about who you are in spite of your shortcomings? Are you allowing him to work in 
you and through you, through his Holy Spirit, to bring transformation into your life. Because if you don't feel like you're transforming, then does he know you? Because he wants to know you. People that know Jesus are known by him. They're transformed people. They cannot remain the same. You cannot remain who you are or who you were. You must become somebody different. That is the grace of being known. Because Jesus said to him, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. The gift, the grace of of being known by Jesus, of being recognized by Jesus, of being acknowledged by Jesus because you've brought yourself to him, is that you will enter with him into paradise. Paradise simply means heavenly places. The place where God is and the place that God will bring at the consummation. The criminal in his final moments confessed, believed, and allowed himself to be known by Jesus. And then he asked Jesus to remember him. He asked Jesus, will you know me when I stand before you? And Jesus obliged by saying yes. In fact, not just in the distant future, but today. You will be with me in paradise. So I want to wrap up with this. Don't wait. Don't wait. Wait. In fact, the very good news about being with Jesus in paradise is that it is not some far off, distant, obtainable future. It is something available right now. I know this because Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7 says this But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Right now, eternity is available right now. Now, your eternal life begins the moment you accept Jesus. The question is, are you going to allow yourself to be known by him so that you might live into the richness of the life that he wants to offer you? One that says no to the wages of sin, which is death, and yes to the life that is in Christ. I give you permission today to do one very selfish thing, and this is the one selfish thing that you are allowed to do for the rest of your life. Be in relationship with Jesus. Know him, but let him know you. Trade it for nothing. Sacrifice nothing for it. Give everything you have and everything you are to secure it and go after it. Let nobody rob it from you, ask you to give it up. You cling to it as if your very life depended on it because it does. If you are to be selfish, be selfish for one thing your relationship with Christ and do not let anyone take it from you. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, thank you that you have invited us into relationship with you. It is not simply that we believe. It is not simply that we know. It is that we know and are known Lord, let us bring ourselves to you. Confess ourselves to you. Repent to you. And then let us hear you speak to us about who we are in spite of ourselves. I want to be like you, Jesus. And the only way to be like you, to be transformed like you, is to know you and be known by you. That is the call of the follower of Christ in our lives. So let us know you, Jesus, and let us let you know who we are. Amen.